Welcome to Fact and Fiction in the U.S.-China Intellectual Property Trade War. This is the third of five programs in our Seeking Truth Through Facts U.S.-China program series. We have a terrific audience today. Over 360 people have signed up. With us, our Honorary Chair Jack Wadsworth, our Chair Ken Wilcox, about 12 board members. We also have uh, global trustees as well as the VP of our Policy Institute, Wendy Cutler. We have colleagues from Hong Kong, New York, Southern California, and a couple for former ambassadors. I'm Margaret Conley, Executive Director of the Northern California Center. Our format today, I'm going to introduce Mark Cohen, who is our keynote speaker. He's our IP expert, and he's also our board member. He's going to give a presentation and keep watch of your screens because he's going to kick it off with a couple polls. He's going to ask for your audience feedback right away, so keep an eye on your screens. After that, he is going to introduce our four panelists. They'll have a moderated discussion, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. If you have a question, and you can start those questions right now, put them in the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. Uh, Mark is going to monitor those, and he is asking if you have a specific question for a specific speaker or for him, please note that in your question as well. Speaker bios are on our website. They're also in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. This program is on the record. We are recording. We have about an hour and a half for the program and we'll end at 6.30 Pacific. Now, a few words about our keynote speaker today, Mark Cohen. Mark is a senior distinguished research fellow and lecturer in law at Berkeley Law. He was the former senior advisor to the director of the US Patent and Trademark Office, a visiting professor at Fordham Law, a director of international IP policy at Fordham Law, the first patent and trademark official resident in China, and he was also general counsel for a mid-sized pharmaceutical company. Mark has received many awards, including the Meritorious Service Award. That's the highest award granted to the federal service. It was awarded by the US president to Mark on intellectual transfer with China. So Mark, we cannot wait for this presentation today. It's all yours. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. And thank you to the Asia Society for arranging this great event. I'm getting a bit of an echo, are we okay? I hope we're okay. Okay, so. Uh, before we get started, I want to get, conduct two brief polls. These are both intended to help us understand you, this audience, uh, uh, about how you understand the current environment for IP protection in, in China. I got to deal with the audio here. One second. Okay, so if we could have the first poll up. Uh, you'll have about 30 seconds to answer this question, about one minute for the second question. The first question asks whether the IP environment in China is getting better or worse or staying the same. Uh, I've been asking this question for about two decades and I can say that in general, US companies believe the situation is getting better in China, but uh, I wanna hear your opinion. Or you have no opinion. Hmm. Well, there you go. Okay. Okay, so uh, we can stop this poll at, uh, and show it to the audience. Uh, so 57% say, it's getting better, 11% worse, some of both, 17% no opinion. Uh, and I am a some of both person. That's interesting. That's actually lower than I think I've seen it in recent years. About 57% think it's better. Usually we get about 80, 90%. Uh, next question is what are the main issues uh, that you believe are facing uh, us in the IP environment in China? And on this, uh, uh, choose what you think is the principal issue. And we can only, we only had a limited number that we could select.
Okay, so some of these overlap. We have about two thirds. Why don't we show the poll to everybody? Um, the about one third, 35% say IP theft, whatever that means, including trade secret theft, economic espionage is the key issue. That really shows, I think, the impact of the uh, 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 trade war on people's perception of the problems in China. And then 22% talked about IP rights in China. It's closely related to IP theft. And 21% about counterfeiting and other knockoffs. And the West, the rest is pretty uh, minimal, less than 10%, although 8% say the problem is Western businessmen not willing to adapt. Uh, so again, that's very, very interesting information. I think it also shows some, some impact of the current trade war. Uh, so if you can close the poll, I'm happy to talk now. The next 20 minutes, I want to bring you into my world of US-China IP relations. Uh, relations between the US and China on intellectual property are often viewed in black and white of oppressor, an oppressed victim and infringer of thievery and the victim. Uh, and uh, uh, those who want to collaborate and those who want to decouple. Some of the more extreme steps that the US has taken in, the, in IP in the trade war and the areas of export controls, investment restrictions, tariffs, also reflect our sense of China as an ex existential threat. I hope to present some of the shades of gray in this complex area, drawn from a variety of academic, professional, and perspectives. I will do this in three steps. First, I want to talk to you about some of the positive developments in China. That address that 57% and see if we can increase it a bit. Yes, positive developments. I will talk about some not often discussed negative developments after that. And then I'll talk about some of the solutions for the future, particularly in this election season. Whether you are disagree with my assessments, I hope I will have provided you with some new information to think about. Regarding positive developments, I want to highlight the positive assessments of China's IP regime by many IP lawyers, academics, and professionals. In fact, many of these people think that we in the US have much to learn from China. There are many reasons for this. First, plaintiffs, including foreign plaintiffs, win their cases, often more frequently than in the United States. They also get injunctive relief, and they get it about 100% of the time in some instances. This is quite unlike the US. Also, damages are low, which is true of many civil law countries, but those injunctions against manufacturers or sales in China can be extremely valuable. This first slide, we can project that, shows plaintiff win rates. Uh, and uh, it shows you that um, based on numerous studies, and this is just a sample, that foreigners often win more frequently than Chinese plaintiffs, and they also get higher damages. The bottom slide, you'll see the win rate is 84% for uh, uh, foreigners in China, 80% for Chinese. Uh, these are two different, drawn from two different data sources uh, by two different academics. Uh, the lower one is based on research for a doctoral dissertation at Berkeley. In fact, studies show that a US company is more likely to win a patent suit in China than it would in the US, where win rates average 50 to 70%. These are not outlier studies. As the second slide shows, we can project that, uh, high foreign win rates are also not limited to patents. In some cases, such as for Microsoft in the upper left of the slide, the win rate was 100% for software copyright cases. Can't do better than that. Probably thanks to the great lawyers like Ho Jing on this panel. Studies like these have drawn from, been drawn from diverse sources over the years but they mostly benefit from the increase in transparency since 2014, when China began com compiling uh, compelling case publications. The Chinese government website now has 63 million civil case documents with nearly 50 billion, and that's billion with a B, visitors. And you can see from these uh, uh, three data points that in some trademark cases and, uh, uh, on the lower right, foreigners win as much as 100% in many cases, most of the time more than foreigners. And a study of the Beijing IP court in the upper right showed that foreigners won 100% of 63 civil So this is really uh, uh, remarkable information. Okay, you can close the slide. The question to me is not whether, whether foreigners win in China, but why 
if they do win, they do not bring more cases. They're about 1% of the civil docket, according to the Supreme Court. One reason may be that foreigners self-select their best cases. So they're only bringing cases that they think are tremendously compelling. Another reason may be that companies think a political resolution will deliver more efficient results to deliver social change. Microsoft may be an example of this, as they have long urged the US government to pressure China to implement self-auditing procedures on computer software, rather than solely rely on their highly successful litigation program. And the phase one agreement that partially resolved the trade war has a software element and reflects this understanding. There are also certain advantages to the court system compared to the US, that, which are worth noting. The system is inexpensive. It lacks dilatory discovery procedures, which are also expensive. Cases and appeals are concluded quickly. In addition, the judges are experts in IP and the courts are devoted exclusively to, to IP. In short, you have a fast expert and low cost trial. One can say that the Chinese IP system overall has been designed to be fast, and that's an advantage in fast moving technologies. As an example, design patents are issued in about three months in China. In the US, it takes about two years. This time difference is critical for fashion and other industries. You wait two years, season is gone. I know Sharon Barn on this panel, and I worked on some of these challenges by China's fast grant system, which also limit examination procedures and thereby sometimes raise quality concerns. As with litigation, the IP registration system is also less expensive. Application fees for a trademark are about one eighth the United States. The largest trademark office today in China and probably the world is an Alibaba subsidiary that uses AI and automatic procedures, including searching technology. And they charge no fees, at least currently. They filed 180,000 trademark applications in the first quarter of 2020 alone. Perhaps these low, low cost procedures may also contribute to low quality rights. With these policies in place, it's no surprise that China has a large cohort of small companies and individuals using the IP system. It has about 30 times the number of independent inventors than the United States, a country that prides itself on people like Land and Edison, small garage inventors. To conclude this section, the data suggests that China's domestic IP regime is quite different from what we not, might imagine. It's not necessarily a status corporatized environment, at least not totally. And there are some aspects we might actually learn from in terms of access to the regime. The data I have referred to above, by the way, is completely absent from the USTR report on forced technology transfer, IP theft. Now for section two, the problems you have not heard about. In a sense, we're looking at the dark clouds on the horizon after having looked at some of the silver lining. By almost any measure, patents, trademarks, litigation, China's IP system is huge, and more with deep Chinese ownership and deep government involvement. It is well beyond anything ever imagined in world history. And the numbers it generates today are often bigger than the rest of the world combined. For example, China's patent office has four, had 4.4 million applications in 2019, nearly seven times the size of the United States. The trademark office had 12, was 12 times larger with 8 million applications. Its civil litigation docket is also 30 times the US federal civil docket, at least it was in 2019. China's influence has also spilled out beyond China's borders. It was the largest filer of international patents last year. Dave Kapos, former director of the PTO, who I hope is online now, five years ago called the smaller numbers mind blowing. China also has vast human and government resources committed to IP. It has bigger IP agencies with more officials and offices, more judges, more IP courts, et cetera. It has I specific IP specific plans and its national annual five-year plan incorporates intellectual property. IP is even part of the national college exam entrance exams or GALCOM. Some of its IP leaders and judges have also been promoted to the highest levels of state leadership, something that probably hasn't happened in the US since Edward Stanton, a great patent lawyer in his day, became a great secretary of war under Abraham Lincoln. 
As a state managed system, China also provides subsidies and other incentives for IP creating and filing, in addition to awards, tax breaks, and policies to facilitate commercialization or limit overseas competition. In all of this, we can see the outlines of the dark cloud. Many of the US accusations of IP theft derive their origin from the incentives provided through the rich government programs for China to develop its own IP, which can lead to theft and mis misappropriation of foreign IP rights, as well as other forms of abuse. US companies need to study the competitive risks and opportunities posed by these plans and incentives. The issue today isn't whether China is committed to IP, but whether China is overcommitted, whether the state has intervened to such an extent that the courts and other institutions do not function independently, or that IP even ceases to be a private right, both of which are required by the WTO. Moreover, in this state-dominated environment, even judicial transparency needs to be recognized as a political act. As Jim Mendenhall may recall from an earlier effort, we tried together at the WTO to force China to publish its IP cases, and which has been evident in the cases that China has often not published this politicization. To this day, the largest judgment in China's history, which involved a foreigner losing the case, has never been published. As slide three shows, if you can bring that up, one of the earliest casualties of the trade war was a decline in official publishing of IP cases. And you can see that in the middle, there should be an arrow where the cases essentially flatline from uh, January 2018. These are American IP cases that were published in a database, uh, a private database that derives itself from official sources. All of a sudden, it doesn't mean cases weren't being decided, they were just not being made publicly available. Uh, so that was at the beginning of the trade war, and as with any trade war or any war, uh, often information and transparency are the first casualties. Uh, now, one common criticism of state interventions in IP creation is that China is just creating or generating IP to fulfill metric goals. It is not necessarily innovating or creating value. China's huge IP filings, however, shouldn't be easily dismissed. Simply put, China is moving in a range of areas, and I believe that the threats of China's pervasive technological dominance that are based solely on patent filings are also overstated. However, this is kind of a middle road proposition. They may not be innovating in certain areas, but if you're six, seven, eight times the size of the US, you almost certainly are innovating in some areas that could be of great importance to the United States. China's size in IP can also lead to significant competitive threats. The owner of these rights expects some return of their investment, contributing to that extremely high litigation environment. Competitors are burdened with the cost of determining the extent of those risks, often before they invest. On a national level, countries with large IP portfolios like China may also increasingly believe that they have become a strong IP country, as China does in its propaganda efforts. And this can result in distorted negotiations. Judges in China can also mistake the size of a portfolio for value when they make decisions and can thereby award big damages against foreigners. And this is happening. Now, in the first section, I mentioned that the data suggests that China's enforcement environment does not discriminate against foreigners. There are important exceptions to this rule that are not being discussed, and they can help in isolating critical areas of concern. Much of this belongs to the problem of missing data, that is, publication as a political act. Bias by foreign patent offices is well documented in academic literature. With respect to China, several economists have pointed to bias when foreign companies seek IP rights in new and strategic industries, SEIs, in China. One economist has noted that foreign applicants were about four to seven percentage points less likely to receive a patent grant than similar domestic applications in SEIs. A similar phenomenon exists with respect to standard essential patents. Another economist has looked at the higher risk of forced technology transfer for SEIs. Based on data from the DARS IP database, I believe there are important sector specific biases consistent with the concern of economists and the known biases of patent offices. You can show slide four. 
So it's a little hard to see here, but if you follow the arrow, uh, you'll see that uh, with respect to uh, pharmaceutical patents in particular, but also other areas, foreign tech companies uh, 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 have a 9% chance of validation of their patent rights on appeal in the pharmaceutical sector compared to 40% for Chinese. And there are certain other areas where you also see this manifestation of bias. Problems of getting a pharmaceutical patent grant are fairly well documented in terms of how China has uh, uh, imposed onerous requirements on those pharmaceutical filings. You can take off the slide. In addition to bias against many technologies, China may also disfavor certain rights, notably trade secrets, which may be more prone to political manipulation uh, and to bias against foreigners, in part because they're less likely to be published as cases. Based on limited data, foreigners are being sued by Chinese nearly as often for trade secret infringement as Chinese are suing foreigners. Very small numbers, but that's what the data shows. Changes to China's criminal trade secret law will also impose harsher penalties where the trade secret theft occurs for the benefit of foreign actors. A recently published draft for administrative enforcement of trademarks only permits enforcement for Chinese owners of trademarks not foreign owners. Finally, overall win rates for civil trade secret cases su suggest that civil trade se secret litigation is a very difficult right to win, with win rates about 35%, significantly less than the 84%, 80% that we saw for patent cases. Now, USTR's investigation into China that launched a trade war pointed out that trade secret protection was a major source of concern but it failed to further elaborate on the nature of the concerns, including the technology sectors affected. This is not surprising. Unfortunately, trade secret cases are the least published of any IP right, and a major deficiency in the phase one agreement was that it does not require that such cases should be published. My last point about data that you do not know concerns America's frustration with the role of the WTO in addressing China's IP theft or technology transfer practices. To quote a recent presidential debate, here's the deal. The US has never filed a case against China on its civil or administrative enforcement of IP, nor on trade secrets or patent law, on China's approach to antitrust and IP, on China's lack of independence in the courts, or that China doesn't protect IP as a private property right. In my view, we have not proven that the WTO and Robert Lighthizer's recent words is, quote, completely inadequate to stop China's harmful technology practices. Completely is a very strong word. The one case filed by the Trump administration, DS 542, you can go look it up, was a long overdue case on China's technology transfer regime, filed 17 years, 17 years after the offending law was enacted. We effectively won that case when China quickly changed its law. In fact, the administration's proposition that is completely inadequate was disproven by that case, which is suspended, but we got what we want. We also never have filed a case against China's discriminatory enforcement of trade secret rules, which permit the Chinese government to decline enforcing when trade secrets are owned by foreigners, nor do we seek the WTO to rule on state-sponsored trade secret theft, which has supposedly contributed to nearly $600 billion of US losses. I believe that we have some proof that the WTO may be adequate, but no proof that the WTO is completely inadequate to handle these issues. And the answer is probably in between. This brings me to my last and final section of this lecture, what we can do to improve the situation. Now, some people assume because there's so much theft going on, so much infringement, the Chinese IP system is simple. This is a mistaken assumption. The Chinese IP environment is complicated. Oversimplifying may mean underestimating the sophisticated challenges presented to US companies and indeed to the global IP regime. Although I oppose the tariffs of the trade war, I believe that the tariffs have induced some useful legislative reforms. But we also need to be very thoughtful in ensuring that adequate benefits are derived from our draconian measures. The phase one agreement did very little to address some of the systemic issues I've just mentioned. 
and in fact reinforced some forms of state intervention, such as relying on China's opaque administrative enforcement regime and not promoting increased judicial or administrative transparency. As with managed imports of agricultural goods into China, the phase one agreement is highly dependent in IP on direct government intervention and may be self-defeating in pursuing systemic but necessary IP reforms. I have three suggestions to improve our engagement with China. Number one, we need to self-strengthen. We need to improve our IP regime. We also need to ramp up in our science education and R&D policy. One data point in this regard. Today, China patents in a range of areas where the US has made it more difficult including medical diagnostics. One study identified nearly 18,000 patent applications rejected by the USPTO due to our increasingly stringent patentability criteria. Of these rejected patents, 1,300 were granted in China and Europe. Incredibly, we are rejecting diagnostic patents filed by our own inventors in the middle of a pandemic that China and Europe is accepting. And you can ask who is stealing from whom. Second, we need to improve coordination and depth in the US government and industry. We need more Chinese language, Chinese law, STEM talent and training in the government service, better use of available resources, and clear incentives for interagency coordination. My contribution of one Chinese IP survey class in the United States offered at Berkeley Law is certainly not enough to educate a new generation. The effort is not only important to the US, it's important to the world. The US may be the only country that has the resources and talent to fully understand this regime. The world needs American leadership to address and anticipate problems and to be thoughtful and strategic. We need to put our teams together now. Third, we must never forsake our own values. Our frustration with China does not mean that we should give up on Chinese courts or instruments of reform. We should not give up on market-based solutions, nor should, nor should we abandon the WTO or other plurilateral mechanisms prematurely and with hyperbole. If we do not engage in that struggle, we would not only be abandoning our own values and those of our allies, but we would also be abandoning the many creative individuals and lawyers in China who, who continue to see IP as critical, not only to economic reform, but to legal reform generally to protecting their property rights. In closing, Abraham Lincoln, the only US president to own a patent, noted in his sec second lecture on discoveries and innovations that America and IP were two of the three major factors for innovation in the world. The invention of writing was the other one. We must strengthen these first two factors. While the world is gray, I believe there's a critical role for the US in addressing Chinese competitive challenges for the benefit of all. Thank you very much. Okay. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to uh, some of our panelists and um, uh, we'll begin with Sharon Barner. Sharon? Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Mark. And thank you for that very informative um, lecture. Um, I wanna uh, talk just a little bit um, about my uh, interaction with the Chinese uh, IP system, which really began around 2003, not long after the uh, Chinese joined the WTO. And I embarked upon the Chinese IP ecosystem and a lot needed to be done. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, in all reality, they were starting from scratch. So I start from the premise that China needed to accomplish a lot over the last 20 years, including creating a culture of innovation, courts, agencies, lawyers, just to name a few. And there were and are inherent benefits and detriments to the Chinese IP ecosystem, as there is to any IP ecosystem around the world. For many years during that time, I counseled numerous US companies on devising and implementing methods to manufacture and compete in China in such a way as to thwart or at least slow down what seemed like the inevitable theft of their intellectual property. Some of that included, for example, bringing older technology to China, something that 
wouldn't impact the company too adversely from an economic perspective if it were stolen. Fast forward until, uh, to the time when I joined the US Patent and Trademark Office as the deputy director, I made numerous trips to China, meeting with government officials, universities, entrepreneurs, lawyers, Chinese companies, global companies, all of the entities in the ecosystem to discuss the importance of intellectual property protection and the value of intellectual property to business. And during that time, um, I, I, would, I think that the Chinese ecosystem for IP evolved greatly uh, during that 10 year period. Um, then I left the, U the US Patent and Trademark Office in 2012 and joined Cummins as the general counsel. And Cummins has been in China for over 40 years. And we have significant investments uh, around China, including 10 factories in Wuhan and factories in Chongqing and uh, Beijing. We, we have over $5 billion in revenues coming out of China every year. And so when I got to Cummins in 2012, there were significant issues uh, involving intellectual property theft and misuse in China, including counterfeiting, engines, and generators. In fact, there was a Chinese company that was named Cummins and sold Cummins engines that are red, uh, one of our trademark features. Uh, prior to my joining Cummins, there had been a long held belief that you could not enforce intellectual property in China. But given my 12 years involved in the Chinese IP ecosystem, I knew better. So in 2012 alone, I filed five pieces of litigation in China and over the course of the next six to 10 months, won every single case. So not only did we file patent infringement cases, we filed anti-counterfeiting cases, we filed trademark infringement cases. And, and um, similar to your statistics, Mark, we, run, we won every case we filed. We, we received injunctions and we received damages. I will say that we were careful on choosing what cases we filed in China. As I would argue, you should be in any jurisdiction. I would say that if I were comparing China to the US system, which I frequently call a lottery system of infringement, we fared much better in China uh, than we would frequently in the US. Uh, and so, what we have to do, I believe, is understand what aspect of the Chinese IP system are working and which one have challenges. And we have to focus on accentuating the good parts of that system and how to help them eradicate the ones that need improvement. So with that, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Jim, take it away. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, and thank you for setting up this this panel. I'm always humbled to be on a panel with with you and other experts like like Sharon and the others on on the panel. Uh, your insights are always uh, invaluable, and, and uh, it's great to, to hear from people who have been living these issues for, for decades now and, and their, their experience. Um, so uh, both of you, uh, both Mark and Sharon, have made a great case for why the Chinese system is improving. Um, uh, but at the same time, the, the debate over IP uh, and its impact on the U.S.-China relations uh, uh, is, is not going to change really as long as U.S. industry keeps telling the U.S. government that there are major problems still to be resolved. That really is, is the fundamental issue when we're talking about some of these issues. And here I'm distinguishing between uh, IP in the sense that we've been talking about it, enforcement cases, court proceedings, getting injunctions and the like from the, the newer or cutting edge issues such as IP acquisition through subsidized investment and technology transfer and those issues. Um, so just looking at uh, um, the way the business has business community has reported the issues uh, over, over the last year, uh, there was a recent US China Business Council survey uh, that reported that 61% of respondents said that China's IP protection had improved or greatly improved over the last decade. That corresponds with exactly what you've been saying, 
in terms of the, the, the trends we've been seeing. Only 2% said uh, the, the environment had deteriorated. Um, at the same time, though, uh, the same US CBC survey said that only 38% of the company, uh, the company surveyed said that China's level of IP enforcement had no impact on their business operations. Only 38% said that. So that leaves 62% saying that there was in fact some impact on their operations due to the uh, environment for, for IP protection in China. Among the various issues that were identified were things like um, limiting the number of, uh, number and types of products that were manufactured in China, limiting the types of products that were sold to China, limiting R&D activity in China and so forth. Um, furthermore, when you, when you look at uh, what, what the business community is saying to the US Trade Representative's Office, which initiated the Section 301 action, including which led to the tariffs over the last few years, uh, and is leading the negotiations with China, including the phase one agreement and so forth. Uh, the, the contrast between the, the, the overall view of the, of the business community of uh, the environment improving and what they're saying to USTR is rather stark. So if you go through the, the comments that were submitted, for example, uh, to USTR in connection with uh, what's called the Special 301 report, the, the results are interesting. So the Special 301 report for those who are not initiated uh, to the uh, esoteric of, of USTR's process is, is an annual report um, that in which USTR uh, places countries in categories of, of best to worst, uh, or actually actually bad, worse, and even worse. Uh, the, the, the worst category is what's called priority watch list or PWL. Technically there's a category that's a little bit higher than that called priority foreign country, uh, but that, that uh, results in certain formal proceedings and generally USTR shies away uh, from identifying countries as priority foreign countries. Um, so pr for our purposes, priority watch list is the worst. Um, if you look at the, the comments that were submitted by industry associations just in the last year, uh, uh, several of them ident uh, identified China as a priority watch list country. That includes the Business Software Alliance, or BSA. That includes BIO, which is the Biotech Industry Trade Association. That includes the National Association of Manufacturers. It includes the, um, the Intellectual Property Alliance, which is an alliance of copyright industries. And it includes pharma, which is a pharma industry, which technically advocated for what's called 306 monitoring. And I won't bore you with what that is, but that's a continuation of monitoring due to uh, uh, um, uh, various IP related problems in the, in the economy. And the result was not surprisingly that USTR put China on the priority watch list, despite all of the uh, the improvements that we've been talking about. So, and as long as US industry continues to make those arguments, the USTR is gonna to continue to push China and we're gonna to continue to see uh, the, these tensions over IPR protection. You know, so why, why does industry do this? Why do they make these arguments despite the improvements? Um, one, there are real concerns on over several of the issues that, we, uh, that were highlighted that Mark and, and Sharon have highlighted before, including things like trade secret protection, pharmaceutical protection, uh, and the like. Um, they also presumably see an opportunity here, particularly now to put pressure on China to get some of the reforms that, that they want. Uh, and there's no particular incentive not to put China on the priority watch list if there's an opportunity to, uh, again, to increase the pressure uh, on China to make some of these reforms. And the USTR listens to what industry is telling them for political reasons due to congressional pressure being um, responsive to their constituencies and because some of these problems are, are genuine, problems that need to be addressed. Uh, so despite the, what may come across as uh, my argument in favor of, that, of a sort of political uh, politics driving this issue, the, some, many of these problems are real and do in fact need to be addressed. Um, and as long as that happens, these issues are gonna remain. Um, the other thing I would, I would, I would say is the, the issues that the industries have identified are generally not the kinds of issues that we've been talking about so far. So there does seem to be recognition that um, uh, you know, court proceedings are available, there's an opportunity to bring more cases, you can get injunctions and so forth, uh, but the issues have uh, in a sense sort of moved on to other things like pharmaceutical data protection, like forced technology transfer, um, uh, um, a uh, variety of other things, um, patentability standards, en encryption standards, market access issues. All of these issues are now sort of housed in this general category of intellectual property protection, 
uh, and that's what's sort of drive, driving the debate and the discussion around IP enforcement. Much more, I would say now, than the issues about number of court proceedings and ability to go to court in China, where I think a lot of people have recognized that improvements have, have been made. So I'll stop there. Thank, thank, thank you, Jim. Uh, lots of food for thought. I'm going to turn it over to He Jing, and then after He Jing uh, has some comments, we'll go with Judge Rader. And we're grateful that he's here as well. Uh, he Jing, can you give us some perspectives from the China-based counsel, Chinese lawyer perspective about what's going on? Thank you, Mark. Um, so I, I've been um, you know, practicing uh, China IP law for uh, over 20 years. I started uh, the career actually in Silicon Valley. Um, I always use a two sentences to summarize my, uh, my, my view of uh, how this uh, China IP uh, works. Actually, the first thing is that um, uh, our Chinese people definitely know the, the IP is important. And then we, we tried hard to protect the property rights. To some extent, I think, uh, our Chinese companies, individuals, you know, love the property rights, and our government loves the more incentives to uh, the economy. I think that's probably one of the, the drivers for this uh, quote unquote improvements uh, of the IP system. One of the big things, uh, as evidence, okay, one of the big things is that a, a hot topic in China's IP world is actually the pre, what do we call pre IPO patent lawsuits. I think the um, the more and more uh, companies in China are doing the IPO coming to the capital markets. Uh, we are saying that we're probably going to double that in the next uh, uh, three years. Um, in fact, uh, the competitors are really increasing the, the patent uh, lawsuit to, to fight each other, actually stop the competitor's IPO or trying to go through this, uh, the, the patent uh, test. I just came back from uh, Shenzhen uh, visiting one of the potential clients. The, uh, the, their chief IP counsel is a very experienced uh, China IP lawyer. And uh, he actually was very uh, stressed to tell me that uh, his uh, company has to uh, suspend the IPO applications because of the one of the big rivals that's been uh, warning them on the upcoming patent litigation. So they really have to put on hold. So this uh, probably give you a sense that uh, what's uh, really the stake of uh, IP litigation these days for Chinese companies. Another Another popular uh, evidence I would like to give is that uh, we all evidence that uh, the, the decline of a big of a Chinese uh, beverage uh, brand, Jia Bao, you know, who was one of the, the hottest uh, beverage brand in China for, for the last five years. They lost the big, um, actually a couple of uh, very big uh, trademark lawsuits, unfair competition lawsuits. They are actually almost uh, disappeared in the market. They were on uh, you know, Chinese, all the big screens, like a Chinese uh, NFL Super Bowl for many years. But it's really amazing this IP war determined the fate. Trade secrets, we just um, won a trade secret case for one of the Chinese the wind power company against another Chinese wind power company for uh, industry espionage. Uh, we successfully prosecuted the other side. This case actually was uh, highlighted uh, in, a, in the Chinese CCTV. Anyway, all this shows that uh, the Chinese companies really you know, loving doing all these IP cases, stakes much higher. Another thing we're you know dealing with is that the, the you know we somehow we Chinese somehow struggling you know, why we should really give our whole heart like, so committed to the foreigners IP. That's really the best evidence I have is the patent linkage system that uh, China has been building um, uh, in, in here. Uh, phase one agreements made a big difference actually thanks to Randy and Mark Cohen, you know who contributed a lot to the, to the whole thing. But uh, you know, if we're looking at the whole design, we learn a lot from a Korean system. Um, somehow shows that uh, our 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 policymakers are really worry about um, uh, you know the the, the uh, probably U.S. company, European companies, uh, originators, uh, IP coming to China. We 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 still uh, did a lot of uh, shortcut on the whole system. So um, I think fundamental, the third sentence actually, and I'm just adding is that uh, there are too many things that uh, we probably don't really know when we come into the deep water uh, of the IP. Um, online piracy is, uh, is a big thing. I was recently on an uh, internal legislative uh, sort of a consultation meeting with is talking about the children's privacy protection. And I was sharing with the legislator, I said, well, you know what, you have to deal with all the online pirate sites, you know, uh, the young people that go to those uh, pirated uh, gaming sites, where, you know, if you don't stop that, you, you know, there's very little you can talk about, about the privacy protection. Big firms are doing much better, but if you don't deal with the piracy, there are a lot more things on the stake. I think our system have to deal with um, a much bigger problem when it comes to um, IP. 
And so I'll just stop here. Mm. Our last speaker, uh, but not certainly not the least in this round is Chief Judge Rader, with whom I've had the pleasure of talking about Chinese IP issues for well over two decades. Uh, and by way of a fair warning, he's often the glass is half full guy and I'm the glass is half empty guy, uh, but sometimes we switch roles. So I'm interested to see where Randy is this evening. Judge Rader. I'm gonna start half full, Mark, and I'm gonna oh. say, uh, you know, in 2013, they created three magnificent new IP courts. And since then, the Chinese judicial system has created over 20 specialized tribunals throughout the country. And then just last year, they created a federal circuit type uh, unifying appellate division within the Supreme People's Court that really makes the Chinese judiciary uh, maybe the world standard for uh, judicial capability. They, we know that they handle more IP suits than the rest of the world combined. And that's translating into expertise and ability that can't be underestimated. Uh, now, to flip just a little bit into the half empty category, we have the pharma evidence. And I'm sure Mark has probably mentioned his uh, marvelous inquiry into how pharma patents seem to get treated with less respect at the uh, CNIPA. They get invalidated at a higher rate than any other technology area. And that amounts to a form of forced technology transfer to use the fancy term. If you, uh, a pharmaceutical or biotechnological invention is not granted protection in China that is given protection everywhere else in the world that has the effect of uh, transferring that technology into China without any compensation to the uh, inventive efforts of the applicants. I think China has to get vast credit for what He Jing just referred to, and that is intellectual property has a higher priority in China than I have seen in any other nation. Uh, it is heralded as an important national value on billboards. It's discussed by national leaders on a regular basis. It uh, forms the, the heart of the trade agreement that we just reached with China. It, uh, IP does receive great attention and that is something we should aspire to as, and commend. The, the sad part of it though, is that it can't be used as a tool for only national aggrandizement. It is really an international tool to move technology forward. And particularly in the pharma area, perhaps the United States alone has been shouldering the burden of research and development costs for years in the form of higher pharmaceutical prices. And if China is really going to step up and assume the international leadership in intellectual property that it promised promises and promised when it created all those courts and, and developed all that expertise, if it's going to do that, then it really does need to accept the responsibility of giving international style protection to pharmaceutical data, to uh, inventions which are protected around the world 
and should be protected at the same rate in China. I think that uh, the coming months and years are going to be a real test of China's assumption of the responsibility of intellectual property leadership, as well as accepting some of the benefits that come from uh, harvesting the rewards of intellectual property advancement. Thank you, Mark. I'll stop there with the glass kind of half full and half empty. I guess it's just half, huh? Just half and half, Randy. Like <laughs> 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 the creamer, but 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 I, I that, 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 and we may yet be merging in our opinion. You know, we, I, I, I know <laughs> that's that, scary. That's scary. <laughs> The um, I, I, I want to dial back a little bit to Jim since he's kind of the non IP person in the crowd, so you can have to bear the, the burden of the trade agenda and whatever else. And uh, Jim, you, you made some interesting observations about how the issues have kind of moved along, uh, areas uh, like market access, uh, cybersecurity, foreign investment restrictions, and all that. Uh, do you think that, um, the way the government is structured is really capable of integrating all these disparate issues. I mean, are there enough tech people in CFIUS? Are there enough uh, uh, people who understand uh, US-China relations and export controls? Does USTR have the ability to integrate all these issues? It seems to me this is a magnitude of challenge to the US government that is well beyond dealing with you know, a mid-sized developing country in Central America or, or United Kingdom where things are transparent. And you, you really need a whole group of talents. And I, I, I'm concerned that the US government may not be well positioned to handle that. And, and I, I, I mentioned that in part because all this data that we have on China's IP environment is really not reflected in the trade agenda for better or worse. And I, I can see why people would dismiss the good news, but why don't they accept the bad news? Yeah, I mean, look, I agree. These are extraordinarily complex issues, um, and I, you know, and the the expertise to the extent it, it exists in the U.S. government is fragmented. It's spread across a number of different agencies, and there's not a great process for synthesizing that expertise. Um, you know, and the complexity it, it 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 only begins with the complexity of IP law, and just gets worse from there yeah. because you need to understand I, I, IP law. You need to understand the technologies that are at issue, uh, which are uh, difficult and cutting edge. I mean, the, the, the Department of Commerce has been struggling for you know uh, two years to try to figure out um, what additional technologies it wants to subject to export controls. You know, not exactly the same issue as IP, um, but you know these are the technologies that the U.S. wants to protect, right, uh, for national security reasons, and it and it therefore interplays with you know technology transfer and subsidized investment and a variety of other issues. So, you know, the PTO has, has expertise uh, to bring to bear on the issue. The Department of Commerce does, even within the context of export controls, the State Department has some expertise. The Treasury Department has some expertise as the chair of CFIUS, right? There's a whole array of issues that, that come into play on IP protection uh, and on the trade agenda. Um, so I, and, I, and I, I don't know that there's a great way to synthesize it. USTR is sort of built on an interagency process. It's a small agency and it is supposed to synthesize some of these uh, uh, different equities. Um, and you know, it, it, it does to some degree, but it is, but it is an extraordinarily complex issue. Um, if, if I, and, I, and I don't know if the expertise exists. That there is additional funding coming into a play in a number of these agencies that needs to be beefed up. There's not a, there's not a great, um, uh, talent pool on on Chinese IP law once you left the government mark, uh, and so <laughs> and so that, that needs to be rebuilt uh, to to some degree, and uh, and and all of these things need to be need to be synthesized. I do want to take um, take issue, I guess, with with one point you raised, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing with it, but it's a little bit more nuanced, I think, which is you know the tools that are available for addressing these issues. In particular, I'm talking about the WTO. Here, um, I don't know that they're adequate. To be perfectly frank, right. mm -hmm. um, the, the the standards are vague. Uh, when we're talking about enforcement standards, they talk about things like 
um, courts should have the authority to do X, Y, and Z. They don't actually have any, uh, there's no compulsion for them to actually utilize that authority in any particular way. Um, they're very fact intensive. If you want to bring a case on uh, failure to enforce or, or an inadequate trade protect trade secret law, um, you have to prove as a matter of fact that those laws are ineffective because on its face, it's easy to comply with the TRIPS agreement because the, the, the magic really is in the implementation. And trying to collect the evidence to prove that violation is difficult. So that's sort of one issue, I think, on the WTO side. Um, you, you know, I know you were also sort of asking about the US government's approach generally on this. We struggled when we were in the government to try to, to, try to find leverage to try to deal with some of these issues in China. It's difficult because of the way the WTO agreements are structured. So the US was sort of driven, I think, to this, this place of taking matters into its own hands. Uh, to some degree, that may have been necessary to deal with some of these issues because the rules are, are, not, are not adequate. Um, and so, you know, as, as we think, as we go further down this road, thinking creatively outside the box, however you want to characterize it, on trade policy. I think we need to do the same on a lot of these issues on, I, on IP policy and how we integrate that and how we integrate it with a broader sort of technology strategy for the United States. And I think that that's gonna be one of the key priorities for the next administration, yeah. whichever administration that may be. Yeah, that's great, great comments. I, I just like to point out just two little facts that often are ignored about the WTO. I didn't mention them in my discussion, but. I, I think, Jim, you, Jim, you and I were both involved in DS-362, at least in the early stage, the IP enforcement case. And there were two things that I felt like the US government at the time lost. The I mean, USDR may not recognize it, but I think the outside world saw that the request for China to produce IP cases was never complied with. That was in the buildup to the case. And then the second thing was the request for China to improve its criminal IP regime uh, we got some clarification of what was required, but we didn't get that demand that you violated the WTO uh, 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 on Article 61. But in the next five or six years, 2014, China published its cases. So I, I can't say that the U.S. lost that claim because in the long run, at least with respect to civil cases, we got a high degree of publication. We could get more, but that was actually quite an accomplishment. And the second thing is from 2007, roughly to 2013, I think the increase in criminal IP cases was about 20 fold in China. Uh, so you could lose a case, but win the war. Uh, uh, I think China recognized that this was important and they took it on board. And to me, that means something a lot more multifaceted if you want to affect change than simply looking at disputes. You have to really look at multiple tools, whether it's soft tools like engaging China, working with Judge Rader on meeting with judges uh, or police officers, uh, following the data, uh, hearing from lawyers like He Jing about what's really happening in the courts, and then you can begin to affect uh, some change. So I, I always found that interesting that we lost them in the short term and we won them in the long term. I'd like to ask, uh, change topics about a bit, Randy, He Jing, Sharon, um, China wants to be a center for international IP litigation. And they've talked even recently about having a role in large parallel cases. Uh, is this something you welcome, you're afraid of, or you think that uh, it's something that, you know, we can work with China on so that it really exercises a constructive role in litigation? And, and again, this is an issue that's really outside of the phase one agreement. But I think that is very important, particularly for high tech companies facing massive parallel litigations. Well, Mark, I'll, I'll start by saying, I don't think there's any way to avoid them being a leader, if only because there's so much economic activity there that to protect your intellectual property, you're, you're going to have to litigate there. But I would go on to say that they're already taking a leading role in areas like uh, standard essential patent cases, where there have been two or three very important ones just in the last... Uh, brief while and uh, my estimation is that their courts are really up to it, that they have uh, the capability to administer the uh, intellectual property laws 
according to uh, the highest caliber. The, the worry that you and I occasionally discuss is whether the overlay of state policy will somehow interfere with a neutral administration of uh, intellectual property decision making. So there's a start yeah. anyway. John, you want to well, take it? Yeah, I'll add in there, Mark, from the company perspective. If you are a global company with significant sales in China, you'd be crazy not to think of China as a part of a uh, global enforcement um, regime. Um, you know, from the, I have, and, and, and there are many cases in which China was the most natural place to have litigation from a company perspective. Remember, companies not, are not in litigation for sport. They are in the litigation because it, they need it because of a value added proposition to their, um, to their bottom line. Because if it does not impact their bottom line, they are not going to do it, right? They're not, you know, like I said, it's, it's not an entertainment sport. So when you think about where in the world you have significant sales and where it would be important if you have significant sales in China, you need to understand the Chinese intellectual property system and how to utilize it in a strategic endeavor from a value add perspective. And I'll just give you an example. I, I, I had a situation in which significant sales in the US, significant sales in Europe, and the launch of new emissions and engines in China was going to be a big market, right? And I had a, um, a supplier who um, was going to um, require significant royalties in order to sell in China. So challenge the patents in China because that was the new market and that's where the sales needed to go and all claims were stricken, right? So you, you do have to you know, think about from a global company perspective, they're innovating and creating, but they need to understand where they're gonna protect it and when. And so China has to be a significant part of that if it is a significant part of your sales outlook. What are you seeing from foreign lawyers coming through your door? Are they thinking of China as a key component? Are they afraid of that? Um, I, I think people are definitely seeing China as a, as a key component. Um, you know, some of the patent owners are trying on that, even though there are lessons, right? A lot of lessons to learn. Um, I think our courts are definitely uh, aiming at becoming a, a global court. Um, I use this word like a rise of Chinese uh, court. Like Randy said, uh, especially in the standard essential patents arena, uh, to some extent that our court are even feel like they're obliged to, uh, to exercise their muscles to actually protect some of the local companies' interest. Um, this is sometimes this really come as a defense um, up to, I mean, you know, if we're using the geopolitical science terms is for probably identity purposes, this is actually will make things very complicated. Um, I like, um, Mark, what you said, you know, Chinese IP is becoming very complicated. Actually, all the geopolitical, even identity consideration, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's becoming a huge thing. So I, um, you know, to, not, to another extent that um, we have to say, um, we, um, there are some things that uh, they, 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 the whole system is missing. Um, so uh, the court has to do something they may be not so comfortable. Like in standing central patents, um, I always love what Randy said, we should let the arbitration deal with this rather than let mm -hmm. any national courts <laughs> um, to do this. This is not a healthy system anyway for any courts to deal with a global friend that issue. It's tough for, for the judges, not just Chinese judges, for any judges, right? There's always a big trust issue but somehow the whole global system are not prepared for this. So there's always a bigger context here. Good, 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 good points all. Um, I, uh, I, we have a bunch of questions and maybe I'll turn to some of them right now. Um, one of them is for Sharon. Uh, what kind of damages and or relief did you obtain in the cases where you got favorable decision? And did you find the relief adequate? Um, well, some of it depends on the case. So in the instance in which there was an entire manufacturing facility named Cummins, selling red engines, um, the most important thing to us was injunctive relief to shut the company down um, and to um, 
not only seize the engines, but seize the name back, so on and so forth. But we got injunctive relief and we got damages. In that case, I believe it was 150,000 US dollars um, for it, which was, you know, for China, not insignificant. For, you know, from a US litigation perspective, um, a, a mere pittance for the, um, the damage done by selling counterfeit uh, Cummins engines. Um, in most of the cases, we are looking for injunctive relief. We know that damages is not going to be anywhere near what you would get in the U.S. So most of the cases are about shutting down the issue, you know, shutting the property down. When we are litigating against global companies, right, um, it's a different, there's a different um, outcome that you're looking for, right? It's, it's, not, it's not the money. It's really about, as I said, IP is about adding money to the bottom line. And you can do that if you get significant litigation damages. We are, there are very few places in the world other than the U.S. where you can get what I call lottery company damages. I don't necessarily think that's a good thing for the intellectual property right, um, right. ecosystem to be able to get lottery ticket money that we get in the U.S. So we did get some damages. Again, it would be small compared to the U.S., but for us, the most important thing was injunctive relief. And the injunction worked for you? You were able to shut down or stop the sales or manufacturing? Correct, yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great to hear. Uh, any other, anybody else want to respond to that? Uh, okay, I, another question that was raised, and maybe, uh, Hujing, you could help on this. Is there any difference in the win rate of IP cases against private Chinese businesses versus SOEs? Can you sue a state-owned enterprise? Can you sue the Chinese government? Let me rephrase it that way. And when? Um, I, of course, you can sue uh, uh, SOEs, and of course, uh, you can file administrative lawsuits uh, against the Chinese government. Actually, you'll be surprised to hear how many administrative lawsuits uh, the local government have to face these days. Some of the the Chinese private uh, private business actually take a front row into uh, in that. Um, but uh, it's very hard. Our experience is very hard to uh, to convince our foreign clients to uh, to 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 file the administrative lawsuits uh, against the the, the governments. Um, in fact, uh, even though we our evidence shows that uh, even our threat of uh, the administrative lawsuit against the, the governments actually proved to be effective, give us a big leverage in the in the negotiation. Now, I'm not aware of the, the, the winning rates in terms of differences uh, between, uh, between the lawsuit against the private business or the, the state-owned companies. Um, they, there are lots of concerns that, uh, of that. I mean, dealing with the big local company or, or, or local government or state-owned companies. Um, but I'm aware of this kind of cases. Yeah, I, I think I, my, my guess is that companies think there's a big potential political problem. Particularly if they see the Chinese government, particularly foreign companies who may feel more more vulnerable. I, I think there was. In a... fact, uh, what I want to say is actually sometimes that um, people very often overestimate the the quote unquote kind of local influence. In fact, right. um, I would say state owned companies sometimes are more vulnerable when it comes to risk management. If you uh, if they indeed infringe the, the patents, something very obvious, have a great evidence. In, in fact, the, the uh, lawsuit may be the most effective way to get a good result because uh, all this, uh, the, the executives, the managing SOEs, they are that they, they hate the, this kind of uh, actually quote unquote political risk. They cannot even afford it. Um, but the, but the, the, in reality, the tougher things when you dealing with SOEs is actually the kind of cases which involve trade secrets, involve more tricky kind of infringement. How you can really put your hands on evidence. That's not just about the SOEs. This is more general deficiency of the, the kind of system we're dealing with. Now, US, you have the discovery, which we do not have. So that's a more of a universal problem. Right, right. Um, why, Randy, do you think uh, American companies don't bring more civil cases in IP against China? Well, I think there's been a historic uh, apprehension that uh, a foreign company can't sue a Chinese company and win in a Chinese court. I, I think that that has dissipated as uh, 
statistics have come out. I remember it's been a couple of years ago now, but the deputy chief, chief judge of the Beijing IP court bragged that uh, nearly 100% of the foreign litigants had won in their court. I, I'll be more comfortable when that number is a little closer to 50% and, and uh, things are, there isn't a question of whether you're a foreign litigant or not uh, considered as part of the success or failure equation. But uh, I think there's just been a historic apprehension that you can't sue in China and win. I should say there was a study done by a sociologist at UC Irvine who looked at Shanghai courts, uh, not IP, and he said the determinative factor that he could find was not whether you were foreign or Chinese, not whether you were state-owned or private, but how big you were. If you employed a lot of people, the courts were going to be interested in making sure your rights are protected. And if you weren't a big employee or a big presence in the local economy, that was going to be the determinative factor. Uh, maybe one of the few studies in that area, but I think that those kinds of studies have been replicated in other parts of the world with a similar conclusion. And it could also be because big companies can afford great lawyers like Sharon Barner, you know, to manage them, or Ho Jing, you know, or even Randy Rader. Uh, uh, so so uh, uh, um, that, that may be a part of the reason, but uh, there may be other reasons related to, you know, local economy. You bring a pharma case in New Jersey, uh, that's where the pharma industry is. They really understand the technology and the issues facing them. Um, so let's see what else we have on uh, 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 one question, a little bit technical. Uh, let's see if we can answer it fairly quickly. Difficult one. Uh, the role of anti-suit injunctions in China uh, and whether the authority is from statute or judge-made law. The, stat it's the statute is the civil procedure law, uh, as uh, I think it's Article 100, if I remember correctly. But what do you see as the role of the courts to explain this to people who may not fully understand in issuing injunctions from China against foreign courts that they should not proceed with particular cases because of the impact that case would have on their litigation? This is the parallel litigation scenario, typically with standards essential patents, but not limited. Well, I think that happened just last week in the conversant Huawei case. Uh, and so Yes, China has issued anti-suit injunctions. The United States has probably been the primary proponent of uh, feeling that its jurisdiction deserves preeminence over others and therefore issuing anti-suit injunctions. The, the truth is that there's a conflict between the international nature of the marketplace and this, the scope of intellectual property and the uh, national jurisdiction of courts to enforce it. And so even though you have uh, uh, the Supreme Court of England saying that their courts can issue a worldwide royalty, of course, if you're gonna enforce that worldwide royalty, you're gonna have to go to a Chinese court and ask them to do it. And I'm afraid they're probably not going to give full credence to what the British court has told them that international royalty is. They will find reasons to apply their own market structure to their cases. Uh, ha Jing, I think, wisely so, gave what I think is the, the answer, and that is that you probably need to use arbitration here because uh, this the national jurisdictions just can't... Uh, handle the conflict between uh, courts and areas of law here. So about, yeah, about the anti-suit injunction, um, I, I won't uh, comment too much about specific cases we're dealing with a very big one right now. Uh, but to be honest, uh, all this anti-suit injunction could really devolve into uh, something much darker. Um, we can really see uh, another very happy future that uh, we're going to all stuck into what I, what I would say the war of the world courts. That's not good, okay, when, especially when it comes to the essential patents. Uh, anti-suit injunction is something we, we think is invented uh, in the Western world. 
and but our judges pick it up very quickly. I think Mark actually, so you are the person tell me first the earlier, I think January when you were in that That's seminar correct. in Beijing. I was at a conference. So, you uh, you forecast all of this. Um, it's a, it's a starting um, a Chinese court. I actually think that uh, we are responding to whatever is happening in the in the UK in the in the in the US before. So uh, we are, we are learning quickly. Just one thing you you all have to know: our judges learn very quickly from everything. Yeah. Um, this is um, we, we're really watching on this. I'm of course I'm hoping that our judges will exercise a much higher level of humility. Uh, when um, when when all the uh, like uh, standard central patents issues are 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 are, are involved, this is a really global patents, you know, on the surface is national, but actually really global as a, as a property rights. And then I think uh, this is as I said, this is a new phase. Our judges, our policymakers, have to learn how to um, how to take care of this. But uh, is this raises another question, uh, and also one that's. Uh, uh, been raised by one of the questioners, which is, um, you know, to a certain extent, I think we're seeing in anti-suit injunctions and some other developments, the impact of the trade war and of other developments. And I think that if Huawei can sell infrastructure in the US, uh, but they have a robust patent portfolio, then they're basically left with one remedy, which is to sue for infringement. They're not gonna be able to commercialize their products. So this, this creates a kind of a distorted environment. Uh, 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 in addition, you know, China has very fast litigation and that creates a certain advantage in litigation even without an anti-suit injunction. But when you have sanctions and export controls and difficulty internationally in acquiring technology, whether it's semiconductors from the US or uh, uh, Android you know, software from Google, uh, uh, you're going to have all sorts of other efforts made to acquire the technology legally or illegally, to monetize your IP rights, and this is going to put a lot of pressure on the IP system. And, and we've also seen in conjunction with these, these kind of responses to IP theft, a real uptake in criminal cases in the United States brought against Chinese nationals. Some people have said they're being discriminated against, uh, uh, that uh, it's disproportionate uh, prosecution and disproportionate sentencing. Uh, uh, of course, the administration thinks this is critical to deal with a pervasive, almost existential problem. And I guess the big question I'd like to ask all of you is how do you think the trade war and this political environment will affect the enforcement and litigation, the legal environment, the rule of laws that courts are supposed to apply in China and the United States? Are we seeing pressure on both sides that is going to make it more difficult not to respond to political pressure in case decisions? And what's the response? Any thoughts? Well, maybe I will jump in first. Um, I, I, I think the, the trade war, um, in a way, it's... Um, um, it actually forced uh, lots of people here. I mean, China government officials, the judges um, have a different look about the IP. Um, especially when we've seen how you know, Huawei is being treated. Um, you know, Huawei is sort of a symbol of uh, all these years of uh, you know, like the efforts, right? Innovation or China's enforcement IP, all of this, right? They are the champion of Chinese IP in a way. But when people see that the kind of crisis they're facing, I think actually, this is my guess, um, lots of um, people here, I mean, judges, government officials, you know, um, even private practitioners are starting to doubt what's the really the utility of IP system eventually. So I'm not saying I'm agree with that, but uh, it's just um, making people to easily get into the state of uh, resignation of uh, being cynical. So that's something we are, we are really dealing with. Um, we are seeing actually, of course, on the, we saw a lot of new rules coming out of this uh, phase one trade agreement. We, you know, lots of um, positive uh, rules have been, uh, been, been, been made. It's a give us, uh, of course, a lot of hopes, but uh, underneath, um, I'm actually very concerned when it's come to more of a bigger fight on the, on the, on the, on the higher stake IP fight, like a standard essential patents. Um, more of a reaction um, 
the activated kind of a response will come out of the system with regard without regard to the fundamental usage of the IP system with you know which is linked to which should be linked to the innovation um, this is um, this is my what my personal worry is well when this comes to the future will be way out the only thing that uh, give me some some hope is that um, I think our government still feel like the globalization is um, it's it's a way forward there are lots of active discussion about that China should seriously consider joining CPTPP or at least look into that. This is from our prime minister. We know some uh, very good research has been done, which I was involved in something. And the China started actually not far from the standard of a CPTPP. In fact, the CPTPP is not really that high, right? Chips is not that very high standard. Um, if China, if our country, if our government really sees that China actually is becoming much a bigger IP power, um, we, we should be more concerned about the way the Chinese IP are being protected in other countries, in other regions. And um, maybe that's the time that China should be seriously thinking about um, compliance with the, not just WTO. I mean, we talk about CPTPP. Um, that's probably the, the true, um, I mean, that's probably the truly positive side if, uh, if we can get on that road. Otherwise, we'll be getting to those as fighting using the anti suit injunction to demonstrate our muscles, which is no good, which actually probably going to destroy IP system quicker than anything else. Do, do you see a role for USTR in some of these global disputes? Is this something that seems like the government tends to want to step out and let the courts do their thing? You know, I, I, I'm sometimes second guess it, but you know, exhaust your appeals and then come to us. Is there a role in dealing with some of the frictions that are arri arising in global litigation for USTR? For USTR, I mean, I, I honestly, I think the role in that is, is likely to be limited. They're, they're very um, disinclined to uh, get involved in individual litigate court litigation, right? They stay out of that and they want to deal with broader policy issues. Um, but ju just wanted to, to, to comment on your, your earlier question about uh, whether the, the current environment is undermining the rule of law. Um, I think there's, we need to distinguish a variety of things there, right? So th there's, the, there's the impact on the court system. And what I, what I think we've, we've seen is the US court system is functioning as it's supposed to function. Uh, and and acting as a check within the U.S. system of checks and balances on on overreach, right? I think we we've seen that in a, in a variety of areas. They can't control, of course, what uh, what uh, cases are prosecuted, and they deal with them as they come. Um, but if we're talking about some of the more uh, unchecked assertions of presidential authority, well, I shouldn't say unchecked because they are being checked by uh, by by the court. So I've I have trust in that system. I guess the, the issue where the, the rule of law comes into play, I think is where, at least in the United States, and I can't speak for, for China or other jurisdictions, um, where there are uh, unchecked assertions of executive authority um, delegated through statute or, or even perhaps by the constitution, where uh, there's real potential for abuse. Uh, and without, I'm not taking a position on whether it has or has not been abused, um, but the, op the opportunity is, is there. Uh, and, and that's where I think there, you know, we're gonna run into this issue, whether it be on uh, checks on investment uh, or divestment for that matter, um, or you know, other assertions of authority to, to limit, limit uh, assertions of, of property rights and whatnot. You know, that, that really is going to be the issue. And again, this is an issue the next administration is going to have to grapple with. Because again, there are, there are serious issues of security. There are serious issues of competitiveness, um, but that has to be balanced appropriately. And I, I don't know that we as a nation have quite figured out where that balance needs to rest right now, uh, given, given the, the, the dynamic we're, we're facing. Good. Good. We only have about uh, three minutes before we close out. I wanted to... Uh, just ask everybody to respond very quickly on your gut reaction, if you can, on the panel. Uh, looking back over the past, however many decades you want to go back, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, China's IP regime has expanded and improved significantly. 
what has been the single most important driver for that change in your estimation? Uh, and if you want to just add a sentence or two to that, please feel free to do so. But don't expound too long. Well, I'll start, Mark, and say I think uh, the international marketplace has driven it. That uh, in order to, to participate in that marketplace, you've needed to play by international rules. Those rules are mostly defined by intellectual property, and that has driven nations to improve their systems. Okay, good. That's the international marketplace. Sharon, you want to take a crack at it? Yeah, I'd say that it was the innovation of the Chinese companies and something they needed to protect themselves. So now they have a self-interest and having an IP system that works because they want to go out into the world, as Judge Rady says, and compete. And they need to be—they needed the same protections that other companies were having. Good answer. There many thoughts on that? Yeah, sorry, I was, I was on, I was on mute. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to say it was international trade agreements in the WTO case that we, we brought earlier, uh, but, uh, but I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I, I think it was all uh, or primarily driven by the internal dynamics that, that the others have, have raised. It's, it's international competitiveness, it's, it's innovation driven in China uh, and uh, recognition of the value of IP as an innovation engine. I think that's really what's been driving it. Good. Okay. Yeah, this, I, I actually agree. That, I mean, the local brands of growth and the local uh, the, the tech company developments shaped shaped by the international agreement, shaped by the trade negotiation. Right, so I, I, you know, it's interesting. I think if you take Randy's perspective and Sharon's perspective, which I think was echoed by, by He Jing and Jim, you have a good mix. Chinese rights holders driving change and a desire for conformity with the international system. If you only have one Chinese right holders driving for change, then you're gonna have a system that overwhelmingly protects Chinese companies, right? There's no reason to protect foreigners in that situation. But if you have both of those coexisting, then hopefully you have a great system that is fair to all. And I think that's our, that's our mutual aspiration here. Anyway, those are, those are my thoughts. I, I always worry about uh, uh, a system that's too reliant upon domestic rights holders being potentially skewed towards protecting their interests over others. So you have to have this other balance that goes into the mix. Randy, I thought you were going to say the role of great judges coming to China to lecture on the legal system. <laughs> Miss this opportunity, can't take it back. Uh, uh, with this, thank you all very, very much. Great discussion. I, I know we continue we continue for a long time, but I'm being told to close out. I'm going to turn it over to Margaret Conway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark Cohen, and to all of our panelists, Jim, Hudging, Sharon, and Judge Rader. I'll close with a comment that was in the Q&A. Uh, box. Thank you for the professional balanced comments on this complicated topic. This is recorded. So everyone that's watching at home that wants to take a closer look at those slides Mark uh, put up before this will be available on our website. This program is part of our Seeking Truth Through Facts US-China program series. We have the fourth event of five that's coming up on November 2nd, and that's gonna be on semiconductors. So please join us for that. All of our programs are virtual, being hosted around the globe at Asia Society. You can go to asiasociety.org forward slash online to tune into the listing of all of those programs. Thank you for supporting Asia Society. If you're not already a member, please consider joining us. For those of us that are joining our VIP reception, please go ahead and click over to the second link that was emailed to you right before this program. We'll continue the conversation there. A big thank you to our team, Rexel, Paul Ark, Jamie, Michael, and Heather. You did a fantastic job with this program. It was a lot of moving, complicated parts. And from all of us at the Asia Society Northern California Center, thank you and stay safe.